Yeah. It's uh, my great pleasure today. Um, we've been waiting for this day uh, for for quite a while uh, since the day I heard that uh, uh, this book is going to be published. Uh, uh, I put a mark on my calendar that if the day this book was published, we are going to have a book launch here. So I'm so happy that uh, that day is here, and uh, we have Professor uh, Nagis Badouri and Professor Vadim Nasr, uh, <clears throat> both from uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, uh, are here today uh, with us. Uh, 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 I forgot to introduce myself, but you all know me. So. <laughs> uh, Nagis Bajoli is assistant professor of, uh, at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced and International Studies. Um, Professor Bajoli received uh, her PhD from the esteemed the Sociocultural Anthropology program at NYU. And uh, she's trained as a political anthropologist, media anthropologist, and documentary filmmaker. Um, her research uh, is at the intersections of media power resistance uh, in Iran and the United States. <clears throat> she is the author of the award winning book, Iran uh, Reframed Anxieties of Power in the Islamic Republic. If you haven't read this book, uh, this is the first thing that you need to do after leaving this meeting. Um, it's such a beautifully crafted and, and uh, thoughtful and insightful book. Uh, and uh, the book came out in 2019 by Stanford University Press and has won uh, major awards, uh, including 2020 Margaret Mead Award. <clears throat> Uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, she teaches classes on media, social movements, uh, contemporary Islamic politics, Iranian politics, and society, and uh, and she also co-directs uh, the Rethinking Iran initiative at Johns Hopkins University. Some of you might be familiar with these series and wonderful seminars and workshops that she uh, organizes there. <clears throat> she also directed uh, this uh, amazing uh, documentary, This Game That Burns, it's about uh, the uh, uh, Iranian uh, victims of uh, chemical warfare during the Iran-Iraq war. And uh, this is the second thing you need to do right after <laughs> <laughs> leaving this meeting to get a hold of this amazing uh, documentary. <clears throat> Uh, she's also a prolific writer, and she writes uh, uh, commentaries and op-eds uh, for the New York Times, Vanity Fair, Foreign Affairs, and uh, many other uh, important outlets. <coughs> uh, professor Vali Nas um, is uh, Majid Khaduri, Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies at the uh, School of Advanced uh, International Studies, Johns Hopkins, and a non-resident senior fellow at Atlantic Council South Asia Center. Um, he served as the eighth dean of uh, Johns Hopkins uh, sites uh, between 2012 and 2019 and survived it. <laughs> All of those of us who do administrative work today know how difficult and challenging those positions are, especially at the center of American political power. And congratulations, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, Professor Nass uh, uh, is the author of uh, um, many books. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I think uh, one of the books that was pretty important to me, uh, Islam, and the making of state power um, on the Islamic divide, and I had to mention that, and uh, and uh, Mahdudi and the making of uh, Islamic revivalism in Pakistan, the vanguards of Islamic revolution, Jamaat Islam in Pakistan, and uh, and uh, and he also is a prolific writer, and uh, and if I want to mention all uh, both of their uh, writings, we're going to stay here for another hour. 
to hear that. But I'm going to stop here and uh, and uh, and today we're going to talk about sanctions, whether sanctions work uh, in, in in Iran. And uh, and on that note, uh, please help me to welcome Professor Nasser. Thank you so much for that really kind, very kind introduction. And for having us and hosting us here at Princeton, uh, it's lovely to be with all of you on this really rainy day. Thanks for looking it out. So um, we are going to sort of lay out what we have attempted to do in this book, how we got into the study of sanctions, what we found, um, and uh, really try to explain both the arguments of the book and the, the things that we brought to the table in, in bringing this book to be. So since the start of the 21st century, U.S. sanctions uh, around the world have increased by 900 percent. Um, it is an incredibly widespread foreign policy tool, but it is one that remains increased, extremely understudied, especially from the point of view of targeted states. So what we began to do in uh, John Hopkins University at the CICE Rethinking Iran Initiative, with which both Abby and I uh, co-direct, is that we decided that when Trump began to implement maximum uh, pressure sanctions on Iran, uh, to begin to do a widespread study of what it is that sanctions are doing, um, how it is that, that they are working or not working um, on Iran. And why we chose Iran, not only because both of us work on it, but also because Iran, uh, up until the Russia sanctions, was the most sanctioned country in the world. Uh, also given the fact that it's been under different forms of sanctions for over four decades. So it was a great case study in many ways in order to understand what sanctions do. Now sanctions literature more broadly tends to look at um, either is studied by IR scholars who are looking very much at the tools of how sanctions can be tweaked in particular ways to make it work uh, more effectively. Um, or by economists or some public health officials, uh, sorry, public health um, scholars. But very rarely is it looked at um, by scholars who are examining the targeted society itself. So at CICE Rethinking Iran, in, starting in 2019, we brought together over a dozen scholars from around the world to examine the different ways in which sanctions are uh, what they are doing in Iran, from economists to those who study the environmental impacts to a whole slew of social scientists. Um, and through that, we began to see certain kinds of themes emer emerge. And then we decided to further that research ourselves. So we ended up conducting more than 90 long form oral history interviews for the book. Um, and uh, did a lot of discourse analysis of the ways in which um, sanctions policymakers write about and talk about what sanctions do. Uh, discourse analysis of Western media when it is sanctioning a particular country and what that ends up doing. And then discourse analysis on Persian language media, both inside the country as well as outside in opposition media and in diaspora media. And we put all of these together along with um, economic data sets uh, policy and history work uh, on sanctions itself, and then Vadi, um, and he'll talk l later about the geopolitical implications of sanctions. Um, so we kept, kept finding that the questions that are often asked uh, uh, by folks who study sanctions or look at sanctions is the question of do sanctions work? But we thought that that was actually the wrong question to ask because of course sanctions work when, when they are implemented by a country the size of the United States. With a country the size of the US and the US economy, sanctions do certain kinds of work. The question we thought was better to ask is how do sanctions work? What is the work that sanctions are doing and what is the result of sanctions? Uh, especially in a place that has been sanctioned for so long and under such intensive sanctions. And although this is a book where we focus in on the case of Iran, we think that the findings that we have in the book can be more broadly um, applied to uh, other sanctioned countries as well. Because what we're really looking at is um, not just the Iranian case, but in the aftermath of the kinds of work that we did on the Iran sanctions, we've started new research projects at our initiative at Hopkins where we are uh, developing an anthropology of sanctions and are looking at sanctions in differently sanctioned countries. So those who are not only under comprehensive sanctions, but targeted sanctions and, and so on and so forth on different kinds of economies. And what we find across the board, and then especially specifically in the case of Iran, are a few things. 
Now, what we try to do in this book is that sanctions are incredibly abstract, right? They are sanctions regulations are written by lawyers and bankers. And so they are um, they're things that are really difficult to understand and they are pieces of paper. So what we wanted to do um, was that when we saw that uh, US policymakers were talking about sanctions as being an effective form of warfare because it's an invisible form of warfare. What we wanted to do was to bring down sanctions to the human level in this book and to be able to show uh, a window across different sectors of Iranian society about the ways in which sanctions are working within the country. Because just like any other social phenomenon, um, depending on who and where folks are within a society, sanctions, just like anything else, will impact them differently. So sanctions don't always have a negative impact. It, it, actually, for some sectors of society, especially those tied to the politically, political and military elite, sanctions are highly effective ways of increasing wealth uh, exponentially, actually, and in further entrenching their political power, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so there are a few main findings that we have. One is, I, as I just mentioned, um, sanctions have entrenched the political and military elites within Iran. Two is that it has increased securitization because sanctions, and especially when they are increased to the levels that they have been within the Iranian context, they are a form of warfare. And so therefore the state, the targeted state responds to sanctions as if it is in war. And that means just like any other kind of warfare, securitization on a domestic sphere and repression on a domestic sphere increases even more over the long term. And the third is that um, sanctions severely weaken the population. Um, uh, they make the population much more dependent on the state because uh, inflation has gone up so high. Um, families, especially in the middle class, begin to drop more heavily into lower middle class and, and even poverty conditions. And they need the help of the state in order to be able to, um, to make ends meet. Uh, this, this particular point is very important, and we'll get into it a little bit more later, because it's traditionally the middle classes, but especially in a case like Iran, that has been at the forefront of different forms of political change. And what we're finding is that it is impacting the middle classes extremely severely. Um, so to get to the first point, which is that it entrenches the political and military elites, one of the ways in which it does this is that when countries that have at their political core and in their political culture, a, um, a culture of resistance against imperial powers, like Iran does after the revolution of 79, when they come under sanctions, they do not just put their hands up and say to the West, OK, our mistake, we're going to behave in the ways that you want so that you can bring us back into the capitalist economy. They're not going to do that. Instead, what they engage in are sanctions busting. Now, what does sanctions busting mean in practice? Sanctions busting in practice means a few things. One is that um, countries begin to develop different forms and infrastructures to do trade and to get goods in and out of their country um, that uh, begins to build infrastructures away from the US dollar, which is in inc incredibly important to think about as larger economies such as Russia and China go under sanctions because this has very long-term consequences. Um, but, but more importantly, sanctions busting is trade that is done on the black and gray markets because formal trade is not allowed when a, a country is heavily sanctioned like Iran is. And so being able to engage in trade means that uh, the cost of things is much higher than in, in an economy that is not sanctioned. So those businesses that are able to um, partake in this form of trade have to be businesses that have the capital ba backing to allow them to do so. And the businesses over the long term that have that kind of political backing are the ones that are in some ways tied to the military and political elite within the country that are able to provide the capital for these kinds of sanctions busting. But more importantly, trade on the black and gray markets means that there's a lot of corruption that takes place in um, having um, kickbacks and having bribes pass hands. And so what that does on a social level is that this money then needs to be washed when it's brought back into the country. And so what we're seeing over the long term is that the more that maximum pressure sanctions have been put on the country, the more that you have 
the washing of this money happening within cultural and social sectors. So for example, the film industry in Iran, which I study very closely in some of my other projects, has completely transformed in the past few years under maximum pressure because it has moved from a uh, industry that where art filmmakers, for example, were um, given funding to be able to produce the very famous kind of Iranian art house cinema that we know. And that has shifted now to a studio market, very similar actually to the Hollywood style, in which it is um, controlled by entities that are tied into the Revolutionary Guard of Iran that are using that market in order to wash their money, right? And so that we are also seeing the same thing in the fine arts market. We're seeing the same thing in the music market. We're seeing this happening all throughout the sociocultural markets within Iran. And so what that is doing is that we're seeing a, a shift in not only who is being given funding to make arts and culture within the country in different ways than happened in the post-revolutionary period in the first couple of decades. And we're seeing that that's having certain long-term consequences, which I'm happy to talk about when we go into Q&A. Um, the, the second thing is that there is a shadow war that is at play here, because sanctions is not only just about economic warfare, it is about a much larger form of shadow war that takes place, which includes covert operations, overt operations, cyber attacks, media wars, psyops. So in this kind of shadow war, what happens on the domestic political scene is that um, the logic of shadow war, which is a, a war that is fought by intelligence agencies first and foremost, becomes the political culture of the state. So this is when you begin to see that the, uh, the uh, IRGC's force forces, which are their extraterritorial forces, uh, they begin to, uh, during maximum pressure sanctions, they begin to dominate not just the what is happening in the region, but they begin to dominate the domestic political sphere as well. So as uh, maximum pressure sanctions continue, the political domestic sphere begins to harden. The political culture and the discourse begins to harden. And this is when you begin to see a complete sort of monopolization of power um, by those who are um, a part of what we would call sort of the more hardline elements, but more importantly, the, the intel arms of the IRGC. Um, and then the third um, is a discursive war. So um, in order for a country to come under sanctions, that country needs to discursively on the international market become a radioactive country, right? Or like these groups that are sanctions need to become radioactive. So this is a process that takes decades. This is actually one in which um, uh, US policymakers are quite forthright about saying that they engage in this kind of, uh, these kinds of tactics. And so it is one in which Iran needs to become a state that no other state or no other multinational corporation or business even wants to go near. Um, and in that process, it ends up uh, in, in, uh, engaging within a system in which society becomes the enemy. Right? And this is why then you have instances where Iranian students who are on valid US student visas come into the US and then get deported at ports of entry uh, during times of these heightened sort of political crises. Um, and so th for this reason, sanctions become extremely sticky. There, uh, as Vadi will go into in a little bit, sanctions are uh, meant to be a carrot and a stick. But what you find in sanctioned countries is that the United States is not able to actually lift sanctions. So sanctions are something that become a permanent marker of that state. And that is why the Iranian uh, uh, system has created what it calls a resistance economy, which is an entire uh, uh, in infrastructure that it is attempting to build to do trade away from the US dollar, which now the Russians, uh, think tanks and businessmen frequently go to Tehran in order to be able to develop a, the similar kinds of economic trade. The Iranians and the uh, Russians, for example, are creating trade routes uh, in the Eurasian areas in order to do trade away from the US dollar. So what it is doing is that it creates um, infrastructure because sanctions are extremely sticky and actually cannot be lifted. Um, and that has severe consequences on a geopolitical sphere, which I'll now turn, turn over to Vadi for that. Uh, let me also begin by uh, thanking Behrouz, uh, Musavar Rahmani Center, and Princeton for inviting us uh, for this book. And it's really great being back, and also this time meeting a lot of the fellows and postdocs uh, at the center, and, uh, and also a lot of uh, friends as well. 
Um, uh, so um, just to build on uh, what uh, Nargis said, which sort of lays out the, the core uh, sort of problematics that we are dealing with, uh, I have to also say that this is a, uh, uh, was, was not an easy book to write, not because of the subject matter, but because it has four authors. You're only seeing uh, probably three-fifths of the book because two-fifths was Nargis and then the other three was, was the other authors. Uh, so, uh, you know, and actually Nargis did a great job of, uh, you know, bringing all of our arguments and all of our, uh, all of our uh, you know, different perspectives into what would be a coherent, cohesive uh, uh, narrative. And it wasn't easy because one of us was an economist, as you might imagine. Uh, it was a whole challenge on that. I'm a political scientist, she's an anthropologist, and we had a policymaker who has a PhD in, in, in nuclear physics. Uh, and, and so, so it was, it's, it's actually a, a collaborative book when we came at it sort of uh, uh, through that angle. Uh, uh, and, um, and, our, and our goal with this book was obviously to problematize the issue. So uh, we definitively look at, uh, at, at, at some critical problems with sanctions, but, but it's really a call for much more work to be done uh, on this issue uh, for a number of reasons, uh, which becomes very clear in the book. Uh, one is, as Nargis said, that, that sanctions has become the most prolific tool of American foreign policy, the one that is used uh, most easily, most readily, and, and with great deal of impact. But without really, within international affairs or people who work on di diplomacy, international economics, paying much attention to uh, whether it works, and even if it works, what are its consequences, right? And, and the second is actually, as Nargis was describing, it's very clear that, that sanctions are a political economic tool. In other words, listening to her, you would say, sanctions is the political economy of Iran. You cannot really discuss uh, the, the state of the Islamic Republic today in terms of the revolution of 1979 and what it said and what it did, or uh, any of the thinking or, or you know, intellectual discussions that might have uh, erupted reform, Islamic reform, et cetera. Essentially, Iran today is the state that sanctions has produced, right? In a fundamental political economy terms, the way people in comparative politics and international political economy talk about it. You know, the structures, the institutions, the assumptions, the nature of relationships, networks, et cetera, that is established by sanctions and still have to be studied greatly are essentially have changed the direction of the, of, of the Iranian state, the size of it, the composition of it. I mean, it's very clear to us that, uh, you know, there, there's been a transformation even in class structure, who holds wealth, uh, uh, private sector, et cetera, in Iran just since 2000. Uh, 16, 17, since, since uh, Trump left, uh, le left office. So, uh, you know, that sort of is, 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 is how we, we arrived at it. And uh, there are multiple dimensions in terms of how it has impacted average Iranians on a daily basis. It has impacted uh, social institutions, et cetera. Now, as Nargis said, clinically sanctions work. It's a tool. It's like, does a knife cut? Yes, it does, right? But, but if the purpose of sanctions is to achieve a particular goal. Is it achieving that particular goal? And, uh, and, and what we do in this book is actually to dissect that. In other words, if the, if the uh, purpose of, the, of, of sanctions is to gratify American policymakers, to make them look like they're doing something when they cannot do that, do, be doing anything, yes, it works. In other words, it does make you, uh, you know, like, uh, 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 the, the, the Russian dissident uh, uh, Navalny dies, the United States put t sanctions on 250 Russians who nobody knows who, who they are or whether this is material or not, but it, it, it gives a headline that the United States did something, right? But even then, the consequences are not really thought through. So what does the 250 sanctions mean, right, beyond the initial phase? Secondly, is that are the sanctions about regime change, which is an open question with Iran? in which case it actually has brought about regime change, but not the regime change that the United States actually had intended. You know, it has not produced democracy. It has not produced uh, reform. It has not uh, created a more moderate government. In fact, it's the opposite, is that Iran is much more hardline. And as Nargis was describing, that it, it actually sanctions, everything sanctions does is anti-democratic. You know, it weakens democratic forces. It closes the social environment. It, it changes the nature of economic relationships in ways that makes actually rise of democracy much more unlikely. 
than, than it was the case before. It securitizes the system. The, the, the third uh, uh, issue is does sanctions actually impact the, the, uh, the, uh, the Iranian government and by implication elsewhere in terms of actually changing its behavior? If that, by, for instance, the most obvious being, uh, does it, do, did it have an impact on, on Iran's uh, 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 you know, dedication to build nuclear capability, right? Or does it do so now, right? Does it actually thwart Iran from, from its uh, nuclear program? Now, on every one of these metrics where you look, you would say that sanctions actually have not worked. Not only have not worked, but actually are counterproductive. So particularly when you look at the Trump period onwards, where Iran is put under maximum pressure sanctions, in other words, the sanctions that become the single most important causal factor in, in Iran's political, economic, international affairs, and the only thing that is actually existing in US-Iran relations, Iran's nuclear program has grown uh, substantially. It has become a far more aggressive country, right? Even if you take American foreign policy makers' language at face value, if you take Israel's language at face value, UAE's language at face value, what uh, I Iran is now actually much more aggressive, much more dangerous uh, than it was in uh, before maximum pressure. Uh, it's, its reach in the region has actually expanded, not shrunk, as we are witnessing with the, uh, in, in the Gaza war. And uh, it, it also domestically, it has become a far more hardline country. Uh, in the end, uh, you know, yes, maybe conservative consolidation on Iran would have happened anyway, but you cannot deny the fact that it was facilitated, accelerated, and made much more successful after maximum pressure than there was the case before maximum pressure. So you can look at any of these things, and you would say that sanctions actually has been counterproductive. Now, why has it been counterproductive? You know, it requires a lot more research. The devil, as you know, in, in, in academia uh, lies in the details. So on, on, on exactly what is done to the Iran's economy, what is done to Iran's society, what is done to Iran's politics, a lot more has to happen. But there is a side of it also, which is, which is on this side, which is why have the sanctions been, why do sanctions actually create a scenario that they become counterproductive? So one, as, as, as Nargis mentioned, is that, um, is that uh, sanctions are, um, are um, become very effective on the opposite country exactly because they are lasting. Because unlike you know, what, let's say, Israel did with Iran's consulate in Damascus, is not a single strike, right? It's not a single act. Sanctions, by, by implication, have prolonged uh, uh, impact. And, and they, they, they sort of take time to shape economy, politics, society on the other side, which gen then changes the facts on the ground from, wh from when they were actually implemented. Now, why is that the case? Partly it's in the nature of sanctions, but partly, as Nagis mentioned, is because sanctions uh, never get lifted. I mean, in reality, if you look at any case of sanctions that have been put, the United States cannot lift a single one. I mean, in Iran, they actually give the example of Serbia, that after Milosevic was gone, after Serbia became democratic, the sanctions on Serbia were not lifted. Right? It's not like we put sanctions on you if you do this, and then we lift those sanctions on you if you stop doing this. So the way it works is that we put sanctions on you if you do this, but you have to do orders of magnitude more uh, for those sanctions to be lifted. Right? So it's not one-to-one -one relationship. Right? And in the case of Iran's nuclear program, as much as you argue that it was the Obama sanctions that brought Iran to the table in the first place, which is, OK, let's take that even at face value that that is correct, the fact that the United States so easily withdraw from the deal and reimpose sanctions essentially meant that sanctions don't get lifted. Right. Uh, so, so because in, in effect, not only the United States did not lift sanctions, in fact, at best, maybe 20% of the sanctions that it promised under JCPOA were ever lifted, uh, but, it, but, but at the same time, it actually returned them with much greater uh, force, as if sanctions on Iran had not been lifted, as if the nuclear deal had not been signed, in a way, right? So Iran actually ended up under worse sanctions for signing the nuclear deal, not because it didn't sign the nuclear deal, right? So the reality is that sanctions don't get lifted. Now, this is important to the calculation of the other side, because the assumption is that once you go under sanctions, you're not going to come out of sanctions. It doesn't matter what you do. 
So how do you basically uh, gain, there is a gamesmanship now about how do you manage sanctions, right? The game becomes about managers. How do you survive it? How do you go around it? How do you invest in, in, in sanctions busting? How do you restructure state, society, and economy uh, in a way that, um, that actually circumvents sanctions? And those things don't get also removed easily. In other words, once you invest in industries that actually uh, um, go around sanctions, once you invest in economic relationship, once your economy is organized around sanctions busting, that's not something that you can just switch, switch the light off. Right? It's as difficult as countries going through IMF restructuring. Like uh, some of the people in Iran who were most opposed to Vienna talks being signed were actually Iranian businessmen because they spend a huge amount of money shifting their supply chains from Europe to China when maximum pressure was put on. And they said uh, 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 in varieties of forum that, that uh, a yo-yo situation in Iran's economy is far more damaging than actually staying under maximum pressure. We don't want to go back from China to Europe and then have to go back to China. Again, that relationship with China now has become a fact, if you would, in, 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 the, in, the, in the relationship. Secondly, we, we found that actually the, uh, Iran has understood that once you get under sanctions, uh, not doing what you got under sanctions for doesn't work you actually have to put something much bigger on the table for the United States to come to the table. So whereas in the United States we say that it was Obama's sanctions that brought Iran to the table in 2013, in Iran the argument is that we did go to the table in 2006. We had 119 centrifuges only, right? And uh, uh, we made a deal with Europe that they would lift sanctions and we would give up these centrifuges. We, we, would, we would basically shutter our, our program, but not give up the right to enrichment, et cetera. The United States said, no, we're not interested. So the Iran's conclusion was that the only way to get the United States to the table is actually to build a much, much bigger program. So in their opinion, they went to the table in 2013 when they had 119,000 centrifuges. And then their conclusion was that that was even too early. They should have waited longer. When Biden administration came in, contrary to common assumptions, he was not interested in negotiating with Iran. He talked about going back to the deal, but only if Iran went 100%, did everything that it was supposed to do plus more, and then the United States would decide whether he wanted to go back in the deal or not, right? So then Iran's supreme leader said, well, we'll just go to 60% enrichment, after which the United States did go back to, the, to Vienna talks, right? And so in a sense, uh, Iran has become locked into the idea that the only way that you manage sanctions is not by behaving better, but by behaving worse, right? Because sanctions also has a quality that the United States can impose sanctions on a country, maybe not Russia or China, but on Iran, and forget about it, right? Sanctions do not need soldiers. Nobody's going to die. Sanctions, as, as one author wrote, is, is, is issued by lawyers sitting behind mahogany desks, not by soldiers from the Taurus of tanks. Right? All, in the United States case with Iran, all of the uh, impact of the sanctions is on the receiving country. We don't buy anything from Iran. We don't re rely on Iranian oil. Uh, nothing impacts us from sanctioning Iran. Right? So, so as, as a result, there's no, there's no pressure on Iran is uh, on the United States essentially to keep engaging unless Iran makes itself a problem, right? So in a sense, sanctions actually, the way it's implemented has a counter counterproductive result. You actually make the country behave much worse than, than when you impose sanctions. The very things that you impose sanctions on it actually become bigger problems as you move forward, right? Uh, and, and maximum pressure is a great uh, you know, suggestion of that. I mean, now they, now Iran has uh, uh, about uh, 200 some kilograms of 60 percent enriched uranium, where under the Iran nuclear deal, it was not even allowed to have any 20 percent enriched uranium. The weight of all of Iran's low enriched uranium was was the was the same weight as President Trump when he became president. 
And, and now it is, is, is measured in tons. It was like 200 some kilograms, right? 200 some kilograms of low enriched, that's three and a half percent enriched uranium. Now Iran has, has, has about three tons of low enriched uranium and has about 260 kilograms of 60% of, uh, uh, enriched uranium. It has tried up to 84% enriched uranium. Hasn't kept it, but it has already enriched to, 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 to that level. Uh, because of the knowledge that is accumulated, even if you went back to the nuclear deal, which when it was signed, Iran would kept Iran two years from having enough fissile material for a bomb. At best, Iran is somewhere between two months to maybe maximally six months, and that is shrinking, right? So, so actually, sanctions have been counterproductive uh, uh, with Iran. And as Nargis says, in the process, talking to Iran has become more and more difficult because of the demonization. Because as Iran behaves worse, the arguments become more that it is a rogue actor, and it becomes more difficult for the, for, the, for the United States to deal with it. Now, why is it so difficult for the United States to be more nimble with sanctions? And, that, and that, that's partly the problem. Because uh, sanctions are difficult to lift because they're laws. There's a piece of paper, right? It's not as easy to tell soldiers to stop shooting. Right? It's like ceasefire on sanctions is difficult. And secondly, it's, uh, 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 the, the Treasury has not been set up, uh, has been set up for sanction imposition. It does not have really mechanisms for sanction lifting or sanction dismantling. So you actually went to them and said, we want to we wanted remove these set of sanctions. It's an arduous legal process. It's very different from stopping. Secondly, uh, uh, the Congress has a say on sanctions the way that uh, it doesn't have on war. The president can declare or stop a war. Yes, the Congress has approved it, but the Congress cannot start a war on its own, or it cannot order a war to go on even when the president says stop. But with sanctions, it can. Some of these sanctions, like the Libya-Iran Act, were, were actually imposed by Congress, not by the executive branch. And, 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 and as a result, uh, um, uh, uh, the president cannot actually uh, promise Iran that it would lift sanctions, cannot promise Russia that it would lift sanctions. It cannot promise that if it lifted sanctions, that these sanctions won't come back. And finally, sanctions is an uneven tool because in a war, you say, I stop shooting, you stop shooting. Like let's say with Ukraine and, and, and Russia, just to get to a ceasefire. I'm not talking about a final settlement. But with sanctions, the United States is basically uh, giving up a piece of paper which Trump uh, proof that can be put in place immediately, right? There, there's no, there, there's not a hard, uh, 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 hard thing that the United States gives up. Where, where, where in the case of Iran or North Korea, etc., the, the, the nuclear program is billions of dollars, multiple number of years. It's actually a physical <coughs> asset that they give up, right? Which rebuilding it, reconstructing it, costs money, time. It's not as, it's not as simple. So. The, the whole gamemanship with sanctions has also led countries like Iran to the conclusion that you do, that that is actually not a good idea to give everything up. That you know you 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 have to slow walk the process and you have to hold on as much of it as as as, as possible, and that therefore you end up in a sort of a frozen relationship of of sanctions staying and the and the bad behavior that brought sanctions also stay, staying in place. Now. Uh, you know, this, uh, uh, and we've had a lot of conversation also with policymakers. This is not to say that, that, you know, sanctions as a tool is good or bad in the sense that a knife is good or bad, right? It's the way that sanctions as a, as a tool of foreign policy is right now constructed and is employed that actually uh, uh, is becoming more and more problematic, right? Uh, so uh, uh, it, it is not about whether or not the Islamic Republic deserves to be punished or sanctioned, et cetera. The, the point is that it's actually not working. And not only you're not having an impact, you're actually worsening it. You're worsening it for average Iranians. You're worsening it for, uh, for, for the country in the long run. You're making every outcome that you want from Iran less, less likely than, than it was the case uh, uh, before sanctions became uh, uh, a much, much higher level. And you know, Nargis actually shows this, uh, her, her work in Iran shows this very well in the book. There is also a moral hazard with sanctions because it doesn't matter what we say. 
sanctions are not imposed on regimes. Sanctions are imposed on people. You know, let's put aside this the language. You 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 put you put your you put your knee on the neck of the people, asking them to scratch their government and, and, and throw them off, right? And you actually admit to yourself that this is an authoritarian, unresponsive, unaccountable government, right? So you basically are saying that I'm gonna choke your people to death until you change your policy. While you're also saying, I, I believe that you're a brute, immoral brute who doesn't care about his own people, right? But in reality, when you look at Iran, uh, uh, it is not the regime that has paid for, for sanctions. It is not their programs in, 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 in the region or the nuclear program that has paid for sanctions. It's average Iranians that have paid for sanctions, right? And some facts are pretty straightforward. Uh, when Iran was signing a nuclear deal, the office of Iran's president then had an estimation based on the research that if the nuclear deal had been fully implemented in, in a, uh, over a 10 year period, the size of Iran's middle class would have grown by 35%, right? Which to him was the way in which Iran actually would change with a much larger constituency for moderate private sector uh, democratic Iran. Since 2018, 20% of Iran's middle class, by most estimates, has fallen below poverty, right? And, and the rest of them uh, uh, have, have also lost a lot of their, their uh, disposable income for varieties of expenditures, right? Which then sustains an entire uh, you know, economy there, whether it's arts, et cetera. So yes, there's enormous amount of wealth in Iran now. It's a 1% class in Iran. But it is actually tied very tightly to, 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 a, to, a, to, an, uh, to a sanctions economy. Right? Which, which is woven in with the regime. So, so, the, so the money in Iran, the private sector money in Iran that used to support civil society, et cetera, is now essentially um, uh, closely associated with the, uh, w w with the regime in power. So, you know, it, so in a way, uh, uh, much more needs to be done here, but the, the book in a way is not about Iran in a sense. It's about what, what sanctions has done to Iran and why it's time basically to, to have a serious re-examination about how we use this. Because now you're gonna apply it to Russia, you're gonna apply it to China, you're gonna apply it to a much larger set of countries, uh, uh, and Iran is the best case study. In other words, to stop here and take a look and see uh, uh, wh why this needs to be, to be rethought. so much this is a lot to <laughs> digest here and uh, and uh, you know I, I just want to mention this that uh, if <clears throat> uh, when you get not if when you get the book to read it uh, you get a lot of very interesting vignettes of, of stories and and what's uh, quite uh, incredible to see the level of sophistication that ordinary people uh, approach the question of sanctions and 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 you, you get a very good sense of actually how sanctions are working at the sort of grassroots level and how people make sense of it on their own uh, I have so many questions for you but I'm not going to ask questions let me see if there are questions I start with uh, Mike here <coughs> this is on uh, uh, Michael Reynolds, I teach in the Department of Near Eastern Studies. Uh, I also direct our program in history and the practice of diplomacy. Unfortunately, I found your, your presentation very compelling. Um, I want to make uh, first one comment and then uh, ask my question. The comment is that I also found compelling the description of how this sort of shadow war has created a, an environment. I don't know Iran very well, but is, uh, what I understand is uh, I, I found it very plausible has um, created a uh, situation in Iran where intelligence agencies play a large role in the shaping of politics. Because unfortunately, that reminds me very much of what I've seen taking place in the United States. You can just look at the example of the Russia collusion hoax and the prominent role played by, openly played by, directors of the CIA, the National Security Agency, the FBI, et cetera. Um, and this seems to be a pattern that's only growing stronger. And it makes a lot of sense. It reminds me of uh, a comment, uh, not comment, but an insight of Martin Van Krevold, a well-known uh, military historian who said, war is the most imitative of activities. And the point being that the more two sides fight with each other, the more they tend to resemble each other. 
And again, there's a, a, you know, being in the Department of the Near Eastern Studies, I feel like it now gives me better insight than ever in, into American politics, just taking some works on Turkey. The, the, the deep state, a concept that was Turkish, which I remember encountering it and thought, I could never, ever explain this to Americans. It's fascinating. And yet now it's a term that every American knows. Um, and it's both hilarious, but it's also really quite alarming. Um, <laughs> So my, my question then uh, is this. So it's everything, the description of the problems with sanctions, how they fail, reminds me I, what I thought was the kind of conventional wisdom that people understood from the sanctions against Iran, that what they succeeded in doing is obliterating the professional middle classes in Iran. They strengthened Saddam Hussein's regime, and they pre achieved precisely the opposite results of what they were supposed to have done. And now we see this on the bigger scale with Iran. Um, I think we're going to be seeing precisely the same thing with Russia. Uh, I won't go on uh, to talk about that. And so my question is, is there any, so there, is there any possibility or is there any, I guess, forced lobby voices other than academics such as yourself that are making the argument, look, this, this, this process of simply slapping on more and more sanctions is counterproductive. And is there any likelihood that this is going to stop or does it seem, seems more likely to me as in so many other areas of American foreign policy, we're going to be doing precisely the, not, not just ineffective steps, but very counterproductive ones. So it, do you see any possibility that there will be a, a serious rethinking and reduction of, of sanctions as, a, uh, as they're used in American foreign policy? It's a, it's a very good point. I mean, to your first point, I would say, uh, in addition to, to the observation you had about, you know, securitization, in the case of Iran is also, so when a country finds itself in, in, under maximum pressure, it essentially, in order to survive, it actually has to handle the, the, the trade of the country, basically to security forces. So it goes more than just everyday things. In other words, how are you going to get things in and out of Iran? Essentially, they have to go through se securitized uh, channels. It's just like if drugs are illegal, so you know who, who actually can trade in drugs? It's men with guns and, and machine guns. So, so that, that basically has made our, uh, the Revolutionary Guards essentially now in control of all, all aspects of Iran's economy because they comply all of the supply chain, they control all of these things. I know this was even important in, in why wasn't there more more uh, uprising by, by, by merchants, et cetera, in terms of during the Masa Amini uh, protests in Iran. They ca I mean, they, they, their supply chains, everything is controlled by the Revolutionary Guards. There's no such thing as independent bazaar, independent economy in Iran anymore, from banking, et cetera. So this is a condition that we created, right? That, uh, uh, that, that actually chokes, if you would, the ability of a, so of a social movement to really catch fire and become a, become a mass movement. You know. Uh, that's partly our hope with this book. In fact, we wrote it particularly in a way that, yes, it, it has academic roots and academic basis, but our goal was actually to really, you know, pincer through, I mean, the, you know, Negar here is working on sort of the, uh, you know, the way in which the bubble works in Washington on issues to be able to sort of uh, penetrate that and, 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 you know, to engage people who are in policymaking and others, and there, there are some people who are coming at it from a different way. There is now increasing sort of worry about the fact that uh, it's not just Iran. If you put Iran, Russia, and China all together, then you actually create a much larger Eurasian mass that, that has capabilities to go around the dollar or capabilities to sort of create a more of a global sanctions busting uh, you know, capability that, that weakens, weakens uh, these sets of things. But what you're really working against, I think, is one is sort of a, a sort of an embedded, vested interest by those whose job every day is sanctions, and they're no different than, you know, generals who are attached to their missiles or to their particular programs that they will lobby for it, et cetera. And secondly, a very robust anti-Iran uh, uh, sort of uh, lobby in the United States from various angles, expats, uh, others. Who sort of somehow think that uh, you know if if you get if, if your sanctions are lifted the money goes immediately to Beirut, right? And uh, and 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 sort of uh, are, are, are a strong argument. And and they deny if you would the president or the executive branch or even people in Congress the political um, the room the political ability to 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 rescind sanctions. It has to be a process. I mean, it has to be like 
everything else. I mean, it's, that's where academia comes in because they can actually do real work to sort of begin to sort of push this issue and, and break through some of what has become kind of established view of things. And if I can add to that, um, our main goal with this book and the way that we wrote it was to give language to what sanctions are. Because part of the problem we were finding is that people don't even know what sanctions do. They don't know how to talk about sanctions. We don't have the language for it. So one of the things we don't put in the book, but that that is a, my opinion, is that sanctions are, sanctions are meant to be an alternative to war. But through the research, I'm finding that sanctions are another form of American forever war. And we need to be able to put language to it. We need to be able to debate it. We need to be able to have a, a capacity to understand. And you can come on the side of being a proponent of sanctions, right? That, I mean, our book is really not a policy book by any stretch of the imagination. Part of what we're trying to do is to give us and everyone else a, a language to see the realities of sanctions because sanctions in particular are very uh, abstract legislations, are very abstract forms of regulations that are put into place that even lawyers, when you give them a, you know, something that's been sanctioned and you give it to three different lawyers, you're going to get three different forms of interpretation. Um, so that is done on purpose. And what we wanted to do was to flip that and sort of like flip it on its head and say, okay, well, here's a, let's develop a language to talk about this because without language, we don't have anything to grapple with. Um, number two is that we also um, really wanted to bring it down, like as Behuz was saying with those vignettes, we wanted to bring it down to the human size because again, abstract, uh, sanctions are so incredibly abstract, but yet they have an everyday impact and they impact people on the everyday differently depending on where they lie in, 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 in social strata and society. And we wanted to show that. So the book attempts really hard to look at all sectors of Iranian society as much as one can possibly do and different political factions both those who support the Islamic Republic and are involved in trade and have become extremely wealthy over this time as well as those who have been involved in being the activists and on the front lines of activism in the country and, and taking them into consideration and what they sort of see um, so this kind of um, and, and the other thing I want to mention about this is that another thing that has sort of come out of this work is that um, I've been, I, as Behus had said, I'm trained as a visual anthropologist. And so part of what I began to do was to take a lot of those interviews and work with graphic artists. And we've now developed out of the initiative a uh, graphic novella in order to, again, be, because you cannot, uh, sanctions are not a type of war that photojournalists can document, right? It's not like a bomb is dropped and you can capture it. There's a, but we need to visualize it in order to understand it, especially because we tend to live in such an increasingly visual world. Um, so that graphic novella is now being uh, developed into a series of curricula that's going to go into over 500 US um, high schools and then later into colleges and graduate schools. Because our, in, in, re in response to your question, we need to have this discussion in Washington. I think our book is an avenue to begin to do that, but we also need to have it as a society, just the same way that we began to have conversations over different forms of warfare, although I think we need more of it, but that is something that we're attempting to do at sort of multiple levels. Let's take two quick questions, and the emphasis is on the quick one. There's that lady over there. Well, if I may take a minute to, almost exactly 10 years ago, I was in a bus heading for Shiraz and was asked to give a talk about whether sanctions work to a bunch of American tourists who were there with me, heading from Hamadan. And I argued exactly the points that you made back then, and nobody believed me. And I think it, sanctions never work in the requisite sense with people who really don't like us. They, work, they only work with people like South Africa that are essentially somewhat like us. And it's, you can see that basically from what's hap still going on in Cuba. So I want, I'm curious whether you think that the in increased involvement of Russia and China in connection with Iran may factually lead to changes that never occurred with Cuba because we have we have no we have no knowledgeable people that are actually supporting any of the, the, removing any sanctions with respect to any countries that are sanctioned because nobody understands them and nobody cares about them. 
for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, and I hope it's not too redundant with Mike's question, but I wanted to ask, I think Nargis was getting at sort of the impact of sanctions on the American public psychological level. It seems to me that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we got used to the sort of unipolarity in the world and that perhaps sanctions is going to complicate that again with the geopolitical implications of Iran, Russia, and China. Um, and I was wondering if there's sort of, if even our legislative bodies are to become rational or beyond their demagoguery, um, if there's uh, potential ways to sort of reverse what is potentially happening in the American public as well um, and to sort of demystify sanctions on that level. Do we want to take Deepa's question? Yeah, Thank you. Your, thank you so much for your um, talk. I really, I really appreciated the work that you've put into this. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about how this impacts smuggling into Iran and how it's changed over the course of, you know, the past thirty or forty years. I, I'm thinking anecdotally, going through customs, going through Gomrok as a child was like very stressful, and then now you can just like fly in with whatever in your suitcase, and they don't really check. Um, but I'm also thinking about when I was doing my field work in southern Iran, um, people really told me to stay away from the neighborhoods where black or Afro Iranians lived, um, that they're really dangerous, that they all have guns. And then later I, I, I was told that they're all affiliated with sort of the smuggling industry in Iran. And so I was wondering if I could give you um, sort of an opportunity. You've talked about the classicisms that have um, been highlighted through sanctions, but maybe some of the racial or ethnic um, tensions or, or changes that uh, sanctions have brought about in Iran as well. You go, you go. Okay, so um, on, on the, the, the second question, your question, um, one of the things that I think is important, especially for those who think about American foreign policy, is that um, as, first of all, the, the knowledge accumulates over sanctions, and when larger and larger economies get sanctioned, other countries around the world begin to take notice of it. So when sanctions came on Russia, um, Brazil and China announced that they wanted to do trade in local currencies, right? That, that is specifically because of the weaponization of the dollar. So as and BRICS, for example, is really pushing for more and more trade in local currencies because of the weaponization of the dollar. So this goes to some of your question there. And now there is, um, I believe it's a former treasury officer who just put out a, a book um, about the weaponization of the dollar and how it's going to really impact the she won't call it U.S. empire, but you know, sort of U.S. national security interests across the world. So from that angle, there tends to be a little bit more conversation that's beginning to happen about the backfire effects of sanctions itself. Um, in relationship to your question, Vita, it's a really good one. I mean, I uh, didn't focus in on the border regions of the country um, in this research, although they are obviously the ones in which, I mean, ethnographically, sort of to, to, to take that into consideration. Um, but uh, smuggling, Part of what ha smuggling has uh, allowed for is actually as, as trade with the outside world has become and has needed to shift in Iran and become a little bit more difficult, there has uh, developed a whole autarkic uh, economic system within the country. And actually, when it comes to what I have paid attention to with smuggling is the way in which women um, have, and especially lower middle class women, are very involved in smuggling now, especially when it comes to clothing, uh, cosmetic goods, um, things that, that can sort of be, be sold in, in markets in Iran now that it's not available from the outside. So it's actually led to um, uh, one of the things that we look at in the book quite a bit is the impact of sanctions on women because it's the sector of society that's been impacted the most, and especially those who are single mothers. Um, and in those, we're finding that actually in some ways, especially for younger female entrepreneurs, there's developed an entire sort of micro business industry that uh, relies upon these kind of smuggling networks from regional countries around the uh, around Iran. I would just add one thing. I mean, uh, 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 because w where the ethnic groups uh, sit on Iran's borders, which is usually the case, those are the points of entry and exit. And those areas become securitized very, very quickly. No, not because of unrest among those groups per se, but because that, that's where the, the goods come and go. 
And, and you know, this actually creates extraterritoriality. If you thought about why Iran is so insistent on controlling Iraq, is because Iraq, uh, Iraq has basically become the, the lungs for Iran's economy under massive amount of sanctions. So, uh, so then, you know, the points of entry and exit from Iraq into Iran, which, you know, goes through those regions, are the ones that the Revolutionary Guard is doubly intent in, in, in protecting. 